Tonight we're going to be speaking about the matter, as Brother Gene has uh, said, of, uh, of Christ having entered into the presence of God for us. And our text, uh, of course, is Hebrews 9.24. This uh, portion of the scripture, of course, as many other ones, uh, is one that the people of God ought to be very familiar with. And, uh, but nevertheless, let's just get into our, uh, our, our topic tonight. Now, as I thought about this, as I, as I considered this topic, I thought about this matter of the Christ. And uh, you know that we, we men use the word Christ uh, a lot, and, and they should. It certainly ought to be at the top of the list, you know. But we want to know what we're talking about when we talk about the Christ. You know, we want to, we want to have an under, a better understanding about uh, what we, when we mean, when we talk about the Christ, see, when we talk about Christ, see, we want to, that's what I want to develop uh, at the beginning here. Uh, and so, <clears throat> our, first, uh, our first topic is the significance of the Christ. I want us to consider this one who has entered into heaven itself for us. The word Christ, Messiah, anointed one, servant of Jehovah, tells us much about the nature of God and the character of God as, as it also does about the person of Christ himself. See, just, just that word, uh, it tells us about, a lot about the Father and the Son. Incidentally, I'm going to be speaking a lot about the Father and the Son. I'd appreciate it if somebody would get me a glass of water. I can see I'm driving up, drying up here already. So, uh, our, uh, we're going to be talking mostly about the Father and the Son, and, but that's not to the exclusion of the Holy Spirit. You know, this is uh, the, the Father purposes, and the Son works what the Father purposes, and then the Holy Spirit effectualizes in men's hearts what has been, what has been purposed and worked. See, so, there, so all three members of the Godhead are, are, uh, are involved here, but we're going to be talking primarily uh, tonight about the Father and the Son. The word Christ uh, tells us that the God who anointed his Christ is characterized by his supremely unrivaled greatness and his uncompromising holiness. For who hath resisted his will? And for none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? And who is like unto thee, glorious in holiness and fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thank you, sir. I think it's important that we understand who God actually, we, that we talk about this. And I, I know that I'm talking to brethren that understand this. You know, I'm, if we, we're not in a Sunday school here. I understand that, see. We're, we're talking, we're, we're addressing people here that understand these things. But we're, we're going over these things again, and uh, I want us to, to consider them again. <clears throat> God the Father, or Jehovah, as he's called in, uh, in Moses in the prophets, is the high and the lofty one who inhabits eternity. I think we ought to think about him as that. I think, I think we can think about Father, when we think about God the Father, is too, we, can, we can think about it so much as a household word that we lose this perspective of who he actually is. See, this is the the high and exalted one who inhabits eternity. This is who God the Father is. See, that's, uh, so we don't, you know, in our, in our addressing him, of course he is our Father which art in heaven. But as we address him, see, we don't, uh, we certainly want to, to keep this, uh, this matter of reverence in mind. And this matter of, of perception of who he actually is, you know, that's, that's got to be, that's got to be before us. You know, this was something that Jesus was continually aware of. And you, you sense this in his prayers. 
You know, when he prayed to the Father, you know, he, as he addressed the Father as Holy Father and Righteous Father, and he says, Oh, Father, you know, this is, he, you know, this was, uh, if, if the Son of God himself uh, had such reverence for, the, for God, then certainly we must have the same thing, and even more so, even more so. Now the Lord Jehovah is high above all the earth. He is exalted far above all gods. He is exalted, for he dwelleth on high. His very being and character are such that he must be ministered unto. Virtually every place in Scripture where we're given a glimpse of him, we find beings that are waiting upon him and ministering unto him, hearkening to the voice of his word. And such as uh, Brother Gene uh, brought up the the Daniel 7 uh, prophecy and some of the other uh, uh, brethren have too, this matter of thousand thousands ministering unto him and thousands of thousands. Brother Tim brought us up to date on the on the uh, on the on the number there, right? And uh, now the exceptions. There are some exceptions to this, and that, uh, of course, is where where God is revealed to have these conversations with His Son, with His only begotten Son. He said, uh, "This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well belie- in whom I'm well pleased." And he said, uh, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. And you remember uh, at this one juncture uh, in, in the days of Christ's flesh, you know, the, uh, Jesus uh, cried out to him, Father, glorify thy name. And he said, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. Now, he, God never said that to an angel. See, God never spoke this way to angels not to the cherubim, not to any, not to any exalted being. See, there was, no, there was none other than his only begotten son that, uh, that he said, that he spoke on this wise too. And Christ was delivered, was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. And this is the Christ who has entered into the presence of God for us. So I'm just kind of building this, building this thought. See, I just want us to think about this uh, little by little. Now, I, I, now here, I, this is a, a matter that I brought up in passing at the, at the Delaware conference, but I just want to mention this, that you know Jesus, of course, he was the Word in uh, eternity past. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, right? Amen. We all understand this. Now, in Jesus, as the Word, or Him whose ways are everlasting, or the brightness of the Father's glory, or the express image of His person, see, that, that being of Himself, he, he, he could not, that was not sufficient to, to accomplish our redemption. See, are you tracking with, with what I'm saying? Amen. See, of, of, of that, that alone, you just being the brightness of the Father's glory, that was enough. That's not enough to save you. Mm-hmm. See, that's, uh, that's not. See, and, and his ways being of old, of everlasting, that's not enough to save you. But see, this being who is revealed, you know, in, in such places as Hebrews and Colossians 1 and, and the prophets, you know, See, this, these were his credentials. These were the credentials of the one whom God picked to be the Savior, see. The, see the, so the, we're talking about, I'm talking about who Jesus the, as the Word, see, his essential person, see, who he, who he essentially is. That was not sufficient to save you, but that was enough to qualify him to be the one to be who, who would be able to save you, see? It was, by, it was not by who he, w- who he is alone, but by who he is and what he did in our behalf. See, this was, see, this was he, he laid down his life in, be, 
as a ransom. See, it was, it was, see, there was this, it was, it was what Jesus did. It was what this being did, see? Not just who he was, but who he was and what he did. Amen. Now, the service uh, rendered to God by his Christ, when we speak of, of service rendered unto the Father by Christ, we're, taking, we're talking about something that is of an entirely different order than the service rendered by angelic beings, neither that could be rendered by them. When we speak of the, of the Father and Christ, we're speaking of an association of unparalleled mutual respect and devotion that is rooted in eternity. See, there's, there's, there's no other being, there's no other relationship like this, see. There is, there's nothing to compare with this. This, and, and if you want to use the word love there too, that would, uh, I, was, I was careful to use that because of uh, misinterpretation, but this mutual devotion and love and respect for one another, that this, this relationship that is rooted in eternity, you see. Amen. Angels unquestioningly, unquestioningly, unquestioningly hearken to the voice of God's word and then embark on the mission from under which they're sent. But the association between the Father and the Son was never on this wise. If the Father purposes, for example, that something that is exceeding large in scope, such as the creation of worlds, or the redemption of a race of men who were seduced by the devil and defiled by sin and transgression, then he would have to turn to his Christ to accomplish that purpose. Or this one, and he, who, who, was, who was the word in eternity past. See, he would have to, and of course, the, by Christ, we're talking about, he, un, this is the anointed, so God anointed him. God anointed this one, this, this one who was known as the word, he anointed him unto this mission. See, God anointed him, and that, see, that, uh, that prepared the son for this uh, for this, for this mission that, that he was going to embark on, see? And he was not acting on his own, see? He's, he was... But such, but such a work with this would be willingly entered into by means of a covenant between the members of the Godhead. As he declared uh, by the psalmist, I've made a covenant with my chosen, Psalm 89. And also Psalm, uh, Isaiah 42 and 49 uh, uh, you, uh, talk of this same thing. The covenant would involve unfathomable cost to the persons of the Godhead, particularly to the Son. The details of which only will begin to be unfolded in the ages to come. Well, some of them are now, too. You know, as, you, uh, as, we, as, we, as we think about, as we preach the gospel to one another, as we, as we think about these things, you know, some of these, uh, every so often, you know, you'll be given a, a glimpse. God will open up something. There's some, some word that you've known all this time, and, and there's the gem. You just, you see it. You see it like you never saw it before. What, what, Jesus, what Jesus suffered, you know, and what he did in our behalf. See, this is... Uh, Now, regarding the commandment that Christ received uh, of his father to lay down his life, that he might take it again, this was certainly not like the Ten Commandments given at Mount Sinai. It was actually more like the one commandment that was given to our first parents in the garden that was planted uh, by God eastward in Eden, except that the submission to and the keeping uh, of the commandment given by the Father to Christ, would bring about a complete reversal of the grievous and devastating effects that were produced from the violation that, uh, that that one commandment enjoined upon our parents in the garden, of, that, of the violation of that commandment. Everybody see what I'm talking about? This, the, there was a, this one commandment, lay down your life, 
See, that was going to bring about a reversal of the, uh, of, of the commandment that was broken in the Garden of Eden. See, that was... Angels, even the greatest of them, are not great enough to receive a commandment such as this, neither to have an eternal purpose entrusted unto them, but the Lord Jesus Christ is. In, in every respect, he is the fit man. And this is the, the one who entered into heaven for us. Now, let's just talk somewhat about the nature and character of the Godhead. The word Christ tells us something about the nature of the Godhead as it implies that there are things that God himself, because of the nature of his essential person, is not able to do, but yet that the word conceivably would be able to do if it were purposed by God the Father, even by him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. The word Christ implies that the one who was chosen of God to perform the work is fully capable of executing the work and to bring it to completion. Because the work, because the choice of him that uh, proceeded from divine wisdom as well as the, the preparation of him uh, unto the work. The Lord has formed me from the womb to be his servant to bring Jacob again to him. So, this, so God prepared Christ for this. It was a divine preparation. The word Christ signifies that the work being done in salvation is great and it is holy because, the one cho the, because of the one chosen by, of God to do the work. The work, word Christ signifies that the work being done by him is strictly in accord with the divine purpose as God does nothing without a cause. When you think about this, now, this eternal purpose, you know, when the, when the morning stars sang together, you know, and, and all the sons of God shouted for joy, there in uh, Acts 38, or uh, Job 38 there, remember that, uh, this uh, allusion to the, to the creation of the world, you know, this was... Uh, See, God didn't just say, well, I want to do something different today. No, this was, uh, see, this was, this was rooted in, a, this is an eternal purpose. See, there's, a, there's purpose that, see, God is, see, he's, we, we don't know the, the, the fullness of what, what, what's entailed in this. See, we just, we know just a little bit about this, but we know enough about God that these are good things that are going to result from this. See, this is good stuff. This, these are good things that, that God is doing, see, that he, in uh, in, 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 this, in this eternal purpose, because it's God that's doing it. Well, the word Christ uh, signifies that it is indeed God who is working salvation in the midst of the earth, but he is working it through his Christ. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. The word Christ teaches us that there is a vital part of God's work that only Christ was able to do and that it was necessary for Christ to do. Amen. By himself, he purged our sins and he sat down at the right hand of God. This was something he did by himself because God the Father could not do that. And yet, from another perspective, God was in Christ. See, he was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. See, now, how do you bring those things together? Well, that's what the Bible says. You, you just, uh, they're, they're, they're together. This is, that's not a contradiction. See, this is, uh, this is just two different perspectives of the same thing. There's an aspect in which only, which Jesus only could have done it himself. And there's another aspect in which God was the one who was working with the Son all the way. Every step of the way, the Father was working with the Son, see? In the scripture, the, the word Messiah is joined together with such things as finishing the transgression, making an end of sins, uh, making a reconciliation for iniquity, bringing in everlasting righteousness, 
sealing up the vision and the prophecy and anointing the most holy. It's associated with him that was cut off, but not for himself. And this is the Christ that was, has entered into the presence of God for us. Now, I, I want, to think, uh, want us to think about this, the significance, significance of Christ as a member of the Godhead and his appearances, three, his three appearances. You know, um, you know these, were, these were revolutionary. They brought about a revolutionary change. Each, each one of these, now only two of them have occurred so far, see. We're, we're anticipating the third one, right? And this is, the, all three of those are found at the end of Hebrews chapter 9. They're, and they're all mentioned as an appearance. He, he appeared, and he, he shall appear, right? But, there, but, this, but see, the, just, for, just contrast here when, when the angel Gabriel appeared. Well, that didn't bring about any change for us, did it? Well, in a sense it did, I guess, but it's, it was... Uh, it, the announcement, but it's not a change that we, uh, we experience and we, we know and we feel every day, you know. But I'll just tell you, this, uh, the, uh, the, uh, these appearances of Christ, they have brought about a change that has, that's revolutionary. And so they've, bought a, they've brought about changes that, uh, that, that you can root your faith in, faith in see. They, there's, it's substantive. It's actually, it's not, it's, not, it's not pie in the sky by and by. You know, this is, faith is substantive. We, we actually taste of these things. We actually, we actually know about these things, and we taste of these things, and we're, we benefit from these things. We're actually, you know, this is, this is, uh, this is, this is real. See, this is this actually more real than, than, than what's, what we see here. You know, this is, uh, this is real, it's all, and, it's, and, it's, and, and every time you come back to it, it's still there. It's still there, see. We come in, we've been coming back to this for 40 or 50 or 60 years, and it's still there, and it's, and it's shining even brighter, right? It's even brighter than it was before. See, it's, uh, but see, this is uh, because, it's, because this, is, it's, this is rooted in eternity, and because it's, it's because it's Christ. See, it's Christ as a member of the Godhead and his appearance, see? Now, uh, I want to just talk just for a minute before I get into the, 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 the topic about my, our, uh, nine, Hebrews 9.24 about the significance of, of Christ's first appearance. Think about this. The blessed, the blessed substantive fruits of his first appearance. By faith, we're standing in the grace of God. That's because, that's because he appeared. He appeared... Amen. He was, and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. You know, you know the, see the, 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 this manifestation. When, you know when your, your faith associates the manifestation with the removal of sin. See, that the manifest, this, is what he, this, is why he, this is why he was manifested. He was manifested not primarily to be a teacher and not primarily to... To uh, refute the, the Pharisees and Sadducees, all that, well, that was part of his work, right? But he was manifested to take away our sins. That's a, that's a divine summary. That's the, that's the words of the Holy Spirit, see? He was manifested, he was manifested to take away our sins, see? So you, your faith gets a hold of that, see? Your faith gets a hold of that. He was manifested. Now, that, that, now we, we know that he was manifested, right? He was manifested to take away our sins, see? So, so we, we, we know that they're taken away because he was manifested, see? And he's appeared. He has appeared to put away sin. He's appeared to put away sin. So this, this effectual appearing, see, it, 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 has a, it has a change that is wrought upon centuries and, and generations and millennia, see, and eternity, see, reaching into eternity, see, this is uh, the, uh, the effect of, the, of his appearance, see, has, has had this effect, see, this is only Jesus, only, 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 the, only the Lord Jesus Christ is a member of the Godhead, see, and his appearance, see, and his appearance has wrought this effect. Amen. Now, we, we have received the atonement, see, that's another effect. We're justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is, a, this is a fruit. And we have been made new creatures in Christ. And we're the circumcision that worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, 
have no confidence in the flesh. This is substantive stuff. See, this is, see, this is, uh, you know, this is stuff that's, well, I read it in the Bible. See, well, it is in the Bible, but it's, it's also, it's also inside of us too. You know, this is, uh, so that's, uh, you got to start out with it being in the Bible, right? That's where we, we really uh, wouldn't be any profit to you. You got to start out with, with, uh, with what it says in the black and white, but uh, the black and white has to get inside of your, inside of your heart too. We've been given the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. This is a real experience. Every day. Every hour. Every hour. We have fellowship with the Father and with His Son. This fellowship, uh, of course, this is, uh, it transcends. It's transcendent, and, and of course, words are going to, f- or would fail to, to give the full expression to the to this to the to the involvements of this fellowship, but see this 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 matter of agreement with God, you agree with God, you know that God is is pleased with you, see, and you you know that you know God, see, if any man know God, this any man, and you know that you love Him, see, if any man if any man love God, the same is known of Him, see, that's it's this is something you can know, you know, this is something that's uh, actually is something you can know. It's the, whether you love God is it's knowable. That's a good thing to know. It's it's a good thing to know whether He loves you. Of course, that's uh, and that's uh, primary, right? He we love Him because He first loved us. But it's a good thing to know that you love Him. But it's it's good that you know, when you can root it right in the Word of God. See, you're not. It's not. Well, I have a feeling. I I feel like I love Him. That's not good enough. See, we've got to because because you're not always going to feel that way. So you got to you got to have something that's going to pass through the storms. See, you're going to have to have something that's going to ride out the storms. So, we have Im- had imparted unto us the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This is real. We've been given the anointing, so that we're able to discern. You know what? You know what? We, we actually. You know, so we we actually actually able to sort things out in your minds, in, in your heart. You, th- this anointing uh, teaches you. We have a teacher inside of us, actually. He's the that's the best teacher, right? But we we, we so we're actually as we talked about a, a, a couple hours ago. we as you know the brethren when I get up here, we're just we're just del- delving out the the raw materials, you know, and the car loads of raw materials and you, uh, then the anointing takes over, see, and, you, and here's the process, here's the, so we got, we, uh, your anointing the, uh, works, uh, works on this and, well, we have fellowship one ano- with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. That's, see, this is rooted in, in what Jesus accomplished in his first appearance. See, so it's, this is substantive, see, it's real. This is real. I know you know this, but I, I mean, it's good to have it affirmed, you know, so it's good to have it affirmed again. Let's talk about the significance and effects of his entrance into heaven. Christ's uh, blood shed by him on the cross and now sprinkled before the presence of God in heaven has brought, has has been brought by him into heaven itself and is a constant reminder to the Father that our sins have been thoroughly removed. It's not a situation where, you know, every time you sin, God has to, you know, make up for that. And, and I mean, where Jesus has to, uh, you know, make up. Of course, he is our advocate. But I, I don't think he's the advocate in the sense that, you, you know, the local lawyer is our advocate. See, he's our advocate in the sense that he, he is our advocate. He's not just hired to be our advocate. He is. He is in his own person our advocate. See, he is. His, in his very person, he's our advocate. That's who he is. He's our advocate for those who are, who are living and walking by faith. And he's the propitiation, right? The propitiation for our sins. Now, in his ascension to the right hand of God, Christ has led captivity captive and given gifts unto men. This is real. See, now, this, this is substantive. See, when you think about it, just, just think about, you know, the teachers and brethren. He's, he's given, you know, like apostles and, 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 and prophets 
and pastors and teachers. See, these all flowed out of, the, of, the, of Christ's ascension to heaven. See, they, see he, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. See, they, this actually just proceeded right out of his, out of his ascension. See, so we have, we have you, think about, you think about like ministry, you ministry you have. Ministry God has given to you. See, this, this proceeded right out of the, of the ascension to Christ into heaven. And this would be to the end that they should all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, that the Lord God might dwell among them. That's what in the, in the, in the Psalm 68 text, the way it's expressed there. Now, just think about this. The entrance of the high priest into heaven with regard to the daily and hourly experiential administration of the forgiveness of sins. Do you think that forgiveness of sins could be administered by a contract or by a covenant. Let's just say, could, could God set a covenant in motion? You know, at the beginning of, the, of this age, like in the day of Pentecost, he says, well, I have a covenant. I'm, I'm going to make a covenant that, uh, that every time my people sin and every time they confess their sin, that, uh, that, that it'll be forgiven. No, it just, it's not on that wise. See, we, see it's, this is personally administered by him who has entered into the presence of God for us. You, we, it's this something you taste of. So you know, you know the, when, 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 you, when you confess your sins, if we confess our sins, or if you walk, when you're walking in the light, you sense this cleansing from sin. Well, this, this is personally administered by, a member, by the member of the God who, who's entered into heaven in our behalf. See, it's personally administered. It's not impersonally administered. I'll just tell you that. You can't, forgiveness can't be impersonally administered. Not on the human level, and certainly not on the on the divine level. See, it, you know, we talk about forgiveness. We're talking about person. We're talking about offenses between persons. See, now here, this this is uh, when we talk about this forgiveness, this uh, this personal experience of the remission of sin. See, now this this is administered by our great high priest, who has entered into heaven on our behalf. Amen. The restoration of the soul. Some, but the, the young people were singing from Psalm 23, but I'll just tell you, that's more than just a nice saying. I'll just tell you, he restoreth my soul. I can tell you, Sister e, it's Eva and, and Brother, uh, uh, I was talking to some of the brethren today, but you know what I'm talking about. We've been through some, we've been through some times, some dry times, and it seemed like it was almost, it was almost a hopeless situation. How, how, can, how are we ever going to come back, Sister Betty? And uh, I know you know about this, and, and, and all of you, I, I say this to all of you, not just to certain names, I, all of you who, who know what I'm talking about. But how, in, the, in these, how, how are we ever, we've had this thought, how are we ever, well, I'll just tell you, it's because he restoreth my soul. This is a real, this is a real experience. Amen. He restoreth my soul. Amen. He restoreth my soul. And he has restored my soul. He's restored, he's restored our souls. See, this is, uh, this, you can say this in, in relation, you know, to your, your conversion at the beginning, but, but see, this is a real experience along the way too. See, we, this is, we're, we're, this, this journey that we're on is one of great jeopardy. It's one, you know, what, where there's this, this jeopardy of, of, of going off the path, you know, and, or just, um, or maybe it's something you're not, maybe it's something that uh, you're not even aware of the, of the reason, you know, of, of why, why, why is, you know, like the psalmist, you know, he said, uh, why, are, why art thou so far from the words of my roaring, you know, and, and things of this sort, you know, the, well, this is, this is because God is a good teacher. You know, and, and because Jesus uh, uh, will have the opportunity then to, to, to restore your soul. See, this is, a, you want to keep this in mind. Amen. Having compassion on the ignorant, on them that are out of the way. Uh, this kind of compassion uh, is a kind of compassion that can provoke recovery. It's not that Jesus just feels sorry for people, 
But see, he is able as a member of the Godhead when he has compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way to make himself known and provoke a recovery. You know, just like in, the, in Luke chapter 15, you know, on the, the three parables there, you know, the, the, the lost coins and, the, and the, uh, the, parable of the, or the, the parable of the prodigal son and, and the parable of the, uh, of the, the what was the? The sheep, right, the, the 90 and 9, right? So uh, this is a real experience. I'll just tell you, this is not a nice saying. I'll just tell you, well, it is, it is, uh, it's more, I'll just tell you, it's a lot more than a nice saying. It's, and that's really not the best way to say it, is it? We don't want to call this a, a nice, this is not a nice saying. This is the truth. This is a, why did, and incidentally, why did Jesus, why did he say what he did in Luke 15? Why, why did he say that? Well, I'll just, I'll leave, leave you to answer that. I've, I've had to, I've had to do some, uh, I think it's good, to, I think it's good for you to ans- ask, ask that question to yourself and then come up with a good answer, you know, because there are good answers, you know, there are good answers and, and the, and the answer you come up with will be good. It'll be good for you too. You're glad that he said it. Well, he's the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's his, one of his ministries at the right hand of God. Jesus actually has the, he's like, he's like our surety in this capacity, the, the, our covering for sin. Actually, in the sense, there's a sense in which Jesus is the propitiation. He's the, not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world, right? So every one of the last sons of Adam that you confront out there, See, they owe their, they owe their existence and, their, and the fact that they're not in hell right now to the fact that Jesus is the propitiation for their sins, see? And, the, and God has given them space to repent. See, this is, uh, this is actually the way it is. See, he's the propitiation, but he's the propitiation for our sins. See, he is the covering. He's the, he's the as God doesn't see him. He just doesn't see him. I, I don't see any transgression in Jacob. I don't see it. God says, I don't see it, right? I mean, you know, I don't see it. He said, God says, if God doesn't see it, then we, then why should we, uh, you know, you know, in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 9 and 10, this matter of the purge conscience, it's a matter, per the purge conscience involves you seeing things like God does in, the, in that regard, right? You see it, you see the fact that he doesn't see it, right? You, so when you see the fact that he doesn't see it, then you've got a purge conscience, see? If, you, if, you, if you're persuaded of that, that God doesn't see it, then your conscience is purged, right? But we have to, we, that's what we, that's, well, that's part of the good fight of faith. And, and uh, of course, we, we thank God for, uh, for we, we thank God for, uh, for ministrations of grace and, and help in the time of need. You know, this is a, we have by the grace of God and the ongoing provision of a purge conscience which essentially is fellowshipping with God in the effectuality of Christ's sufferings. He's able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. This, uh, this matter here, when you think about the letters to the seven churches, we, you know, I think uh, we, we want to, when we speak about these things, we want to talk about both the, the, uh, the nurture and the admonition of the Lord here. So here's the, here's the admonition part of it, okay? So personal administrations, both of instruction, comfort, and sometimes of stern warning to all those who are living by faith in him are ministered by the great high priest, see? See, he is. He personally administers. So you, you sense that, you sense that Jesus is talking to you. You want to. You certainly want to listen. You certainly want to give heed right now. Just right, right now. Just, just drop whatever you're doing. Give heed. Just listen to what he's saying and, and give heed to him. See, and sometimes you know. But, but here, you know what? If you, if you see, if you see things the way God does, you can even see some of the most sobering realities that are recorded in scripture and, and it can comfort you if you're in agreement with, with God in the matter. But if you're not in, if you're out of step, see, when you're out of step with these things, that's when it, 
that's when you you get the when the warning comes see and that's when you you feel it chafing against you see that's uh, see that's so you just uh, just think about those He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the, the Spirit say, said in the church, saith unto the churches. Now I want to talk about the matter that, of Christ entering into heaven. He, you know, uh, in the Psalms, we read of everlasting doors opening up to the, the newly risen Christ. One of the brethren uh, alluded to that earlier today. But you know, in Moses and the prophets, heaven was a pretty... I would say it's a, it was a very unknown place. It was, uh, you talk about from the, in Genesis, Exodus, we talked about heaven. You know, Moses would say, now look now towards heaven, or God would look down from heaven, see. But, but when you talk about what, actually what was in heaven, it was not known, the, the in, entailments of what were in heaven were not very well known to the sons of men. There were just, it was just, it was very... It was very little known. It couldn't it, at that time. It, it just couldn't be known. See, it was just it was just it was just not the time. It wasn't the time. Amen. It seems that this is but a commentary on the genu on the grievously woeful consequences of the entrance of sin into the world. The distant perspective held by men for centuries began to change radically when John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus Christ began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. See here, now here we've got, here we're being brought, like brought right up face to face with heaven. For the first time, men are being brought face to face. The kingdom of heaven, it's, it's about ready to appear. It's about ready to burst right upon you. See the... When the Savior appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, heaven suddenly became perceptibly nearer, particularly to those who received him and who believed on his name. In his famed uh, sermon on the, on the mount, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, declared, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. See, there's, there it is. Blessed are the, those that are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the, the kingdom of heaven. It belongs to you. It belongs to these kind of people, see? It belongs to those kind of people. And the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven. Here we talk. Now here we're bringing, here we're bringing heaven right down for where men are able to, to, to behold, to, to, take, to take hold of it and enter into it, see? The bread of God. Of course, Jesus is that bread of God. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I'll just tell you, that's a good, uh, that's a good verse to put in your book and to, and to memorize. This is the, they were talking about Jesus. This is the bread which come, cometh down from heaven that a man can eat of this, of this and not die. We're talking about, we're talking about, we talk about dying, we're talking about perishing eternally. See, this is dying in that sense, see. A man may eat of this bread and not die. And then we talk about our citizenship is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. And he raised us up together to sit with him in heavenly places, giving us joint seating with him. The Amplified verse says, in the... Uh, in the heavenly sphere, by virtue of our being in Christ Jesus, the Messiah, the Anointed One. And think about this, uh, this declaration in, in Revelation 19. After these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven. Much people in heaven. Think about that. This, I don't remember any place prior to that where it talks about much people in heaven. The people in heaven? Is this people in heaven? Not only people, it's much people. Much people. I heard the voice of much people in heaven. And they were crying, Alleluia. They were crying, Alleluia. Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God, for true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore who hath corrupted the earth with her fornication 
and hath avenged the blood of her, his servants at, at her hand. You know, it was at, at the point where, where God judged, when the, when the whore was judged, the whore had to be judged before the bride could be revealed. It was, it was right after that. See, the, see we had, the, it was right after, in, in, if, you re, if you read right at the end of uh, chapter 18 and the beginning of 19, you know, where the, where the, where the harlot, the, you know, Babylon the Great, where she, was, where she was judged by God. It was right at, it was immediately after that that we read about the bride, see. So God isn't going to, God isn't going to talk about a bride for his son until, until all the, the false, the false today is taken away. You know, this is a, the, all the, all the sham is removed. Well, heaven is the, is the true holy place. It, this is the, the constant, uh, this is uh, in constant contrast with the holy places made with hands. Uh, the entrance into this holy place is not by procedures specified under the law, but rather by entrance into Christ. So you just come into Jesus, see? This, this is how you get into this holy place. You, get, you just enter into Christ, see, by the obedience to the gospel. See, this is, it's by our obedience to the gospel, see? And of course, we, we, uh, we, 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 we all, I think we're, we're Bible people, and we know what's involved in that. Uh, you know, the, he that uh, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins, and you Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, you know, so we're talking about obedience to the gospel here. That's how you get into this holy place. Well, I'm going to, I, I want to talk about the, the presence of God. Um, you know, this is the, the presence of God. We can just think about the presence of God and, uh, and uh, as just a, a term, like this is a, a term that we read in our concordance, right? But let's think about it in the, like in the light of Scripture, okay? It says, like, judgment and justice are the habitation of his throne, and mercy and truth shall go before him. This is the, this is the presence that Christ entered into, where judgment and justice are the habitation. This habitation. See, Christ entered into that, see? And, and at right, and his right hand, there's pleasures forevermore. See, he entered, Jesus entered into that that presence. See, into into that presence of God. And at his in his presence is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. See, thou shalt make me full of joy with thy gladness. That's a, you know with with thy countenance. You know this was way uh, Peter uh, uh, said it on the day of Pentecost. Of that great multitude, which no man can number, of all nations and kindreds and tongues, of which stood before the, the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with, with white robes and palms in their hands, it is written, the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them, shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. I, I think uh, I, we're, I think we can wrap this up pretty quick. You know, I had some more things here, but um, we got to we want to hear from Brother Leon and uh, what he's got to say to us too. But I want to uh, I want to just uh, close with this thought of the uh, this matter of what Christ has done for us. You know, there's there's at least nineteen or twenty different things. In the, in the scriptures that Christ has done for us and uh, that, are, that are expressed. And, and I, don't, I don't know if I can, I, I try to look these up real quick on my, my phone concordance just before the meeting tonight because I, I just didn't get this into my notes. But he was delivered up for us. He died for us. Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Now think about the witness, the, the agreement of the witness. All the apostles are talking like this. See, they're, every, every place Paul and Peter talk about this, they're talking about something that Jesus did for us. See? Isn't that something? How, how this, this, the, the agreement in this witness. See? And he, made, he makes intercession for us. 
He was made a curse for us. He was made sin for us. God is for us. He gave his life for us. He suffered for us. He has given himself for us. He's entered into heaven for us. And eternal, he's uh, made the author of re eternal redemption for us. And the way into heaven has been consecrated for us. So now here's my last thought here. This is a, uh, a poem that I found uh, by a man named Michael Bruce. And I had uh, the first verse, the last two lines, I had memorized this a long time ago, and I, I looked for it on the Internet, and boy, the whole thing sounds pretty good. So I, I, want to, I want to just read the whole thing to you, okay? So, where, the high, where, the high, where high the heavenly temple stands, the house of God not made with hands, a great high priest our nature wears, the guardian of mankind appears. He who for men their surety stood and poured on earth his precious blood, pursues in heaven his mighty plan, the savior and the friend of man. Though now ascended up on high, he bends on earth a brother's eye. Partaker of the human name, he knows the frailty of our frame. Our fellow sufferer yet retains a fellow feeling of our pains and still remembers in the skies his tears and agonies and cries. In every pang that rends the heart, the man of sorrows had a part. He sympathizes with our grief and to the sufferer sends relief. With boldness, therefore, at the throne, let us make all our sorrows known and ask the aids of our of the heavenly power to help us in the evil hour.